Greetings, everyone. Welcome to our exclusive Global Leading Voices webinar campaign. We are delighted to have you join us here today. Please be informed that if you have any questions during the presentation, you may type them into the question box in your control panel. The presenter will answer your questions at the end of the presentation accordingly. Now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to our presenter, who will begin shortly. Hello, uh, my name is Ed Goldberg. I am the manager of business continuity, disaster recovery, and threat assessment for Eversource, which is a utility in the Northeast United States, electric and gas. My pleasure today to present on why your information security must mesh with your business continuity program. From a business continuity perspective, and it's a different perspective than an information security perspective at times, um, we, we have to look at data breaches, cyber attacks, hacking, all those things as, as inevitable consequences of the interconnected world we live in. We have to think in terms of it's going to happen and when is it going to happen, not if it'll happen. From an IT security perspective, you t tend to look at things as, you know, what can you prevent? How do you prevent it? Is there anything that can't be prevented? And we know that there are some things, but, you know, at some point you, you have to decide, you know, what risks are acceptable and what aren't and where you put your resources to protect. So we're, we're very, very reliant and more so as time goes on, on, on data and machines that in the end makes us vulnerable when those things are abused. So a rigorous business continuity program may be thought of as your last line of defense, but it's also a step towards the preparedness that makes you a less attractive target. Um, and it protects you and your organization um, from the things we know, but also things like loss of reputation and so forth. Uh, what, what I'll do is I'm going to try to give some common understanding to our terms so that we make sure we're on the same page um, and so we can have some, you know, I can have some discussion that hopefully you find useful. Business continuity, um, the program, the process, the plans, they prepare an organization to continue critical business processes during and after a disaster or whatever you like to call it that ends up being your disruptive event. It's not really a defensive posture so much as, as I mentioned before, the last line of defense, the go-to plan. Once your defenses have failed or something bad is, has occurred, and, and when I say defenses have failed, um, it, it, it doesn't mean you know, that, that, that you're a failure per se. Organizations, I'll talk to that in a moment, um, get hacked all the time. And they're not bad people and they're not bad organizations and they're not employing bad practices and there's just some things that can't be um, foreseen and sometimes you might look back and say oh we should have done this we should have done that and other times it's a case of personnel where you see someone and you say oh, i knew he was a bad person that type of thing but you know not so easy uh, on the front end of it so we'll see um the value that's that goes beyond business continuity just being the last line of defense and, and uh, depending on the type of organization, um, what what those plans are, um, you know, very briefly, a lot of times in, in government, in non-business type organizations, they call them continuity of operation plans. Nowadays, business continuity is an element of resiliency. Um, so some people have resiliency plans, but in the end, we're, we're trying to get to the same thing. So we'll just talk commonality. For disaster recovery, there's a lot of different definitions, but the way we'll use it today, just so we're clear, is the IT stuff. It's the plans that information technology people use to, resource, to restore systems after a disruptive event or a disaster. Um, it may or may not be the same plans that they use when there's a single IT malfunction. So DR plans might be for when you lose the whole data center in some organizations, and in some organizations it might be when you lose one critical element. Um, and, and I'll talk to that as well. And IT security is that defensive posture um, that, that, that our organizations take to protect computing environments, right? So that's a pretty broad statement. Could be hardware, could be software, could be the data itself, could be machinery that's controlled by computers. Um, and anything that goes along those, those lines where someone getting into it can steal something can take data can disrupt things can damage things can change 
uh, the, the, the conditions that uh, the services are uh, providing. And resiliency um, is, is the ability to, you know, the ability to bounce. It's, it's humorous, but really it's the ability to withstand disruptive incidents, disasters, those things uh, that uh, we have to do, that we are able to keep doing them even in the face of challenges. The business impact analysis, of, you know, I know this is basics for most of you. It's that planning step where we take risk information about threats um, and the consequences of those things occurring and the disruption that they cause to the critical business processes. It's a risk analysis based on known threats that feeds the, the more comprehensive look at, now we know what could happen, what if it does happen, and what will it cause in terms of our, our work or our processes or whatever it is that we do that we have to keep doing. IT uses it to create disaster recovery plans because the timing of these threats occurring uh, and the, the, the stoppage or um, uh, disruption to a business process, um, depending on how long it, could, it can last and what our reaction to that is and what happens because of it. So it, the BIA needs to be done periodically, um, every two years, every three years, every year, it depends on the organization. Um, but it also needs to be done whenever things change because you have to reassess the conditions that you use to create your plans if the, the environment changes. So what's needed to perform a bit of a critical business process? Um, business continuity plans provide what's needed to maintain or restart that process. So we know usually we need people, we need facilities, which can be buildings or equipment, we need systems, we probably need stuff, um, some kind of supplies through a supply chain. Um, we probably need some information or intelligence, and we also have or can lose um, uh, reputation, so we might have compensatory measures for that, you know, involving communications and so forth, um, and, and making people whole if it affects our customers, for example. So a quick review of the business continuity process will get us into this discussion. Um, the threat assessment, the hazard assessment, the risk assessment, uh, those things threaten business processes. How likely are they to occur? How severe are the consequences of them occurring? Um, we look at that through that business impact analysis, which is really a, a, an inventory of everything that we have to do and all the things that can happen to it. Um, we process that information into a business continuity plan. We come up with recovery time objectives. That's how long we can do without the system, the, 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 the process that we need. And the recovery point objective, which relates to data, um, how long a period we can have a data gap. I always like to use email as a simple uh, analogy so that people can understand it, perhaps. that if you have a, your email system goes down, how long can you do without your email? You might be able to do it without it for five minutes or for five days. It's probably, you know, going to start to impact your work after, you know, half an hour or an hour. And it certainly depends entirely on what it is you do. It's email. But as long as you know that when the email system comes back, anything that anybody sent you is still waiting for you, you're okay with it usually because you'll just catch up. But if that information is not there, if people sent you email during the hour that the system was down and that email went into the bit bucket, it, it disappeared and you have no way of knowing who sent you what during that time, that's much more disruptive to your, to your business, to your, your processes. And that's the RPO. So if you can afford to lose an hour's worth of email or an hour's worth of data, then that's, that's your recovery point objective. Um, in, in many cases, that's zero, especially if it's transactional, it's you know, financial stuff, anything where, where there's money associated with, with an, a, 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 a transaction, or if there's some other critical element to a process that you're losing, um, then you don't want to have any uh, lost data. And so, the two sometimes don't really have anything to do with each other. The loss of the access to the system and the loss of the actual data behind it. <clears throat> the old model, um, for those of you that are at least uh, maybe as old as me, um, you go back some years, 
certainly before uh, the events of 9/11 in the United States, uh, and and, um, and and sometime before that, people thought of business continuity in terms of really just disaster recovery. In other words, we have data, and we we back it up on tape, and we send the tape off to a vault somewhere off site. So we have a copy in case something happens to our system, happens to our facility and all. But no one really was thinking in, 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 in terms of the actual reality of losing wholesale um, your people, your buildings, uh, and, and the, uh, the information systems that, that they house. So business continuity planning, at least here in the States, and, and, and I, you know, from my observation around the world, really, really got very popular um, after 9-11. And uh, you know, sadly, that's the way we 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 tend to plan over the years. Um, I'm sure there wasn't a big emphasis on on data backup when they first implemented computers, and then when someone lost data that they had to have, then they started thinking about backing things up. I'm sure that was you know decades and decades ago before me even. But I know that that's the way we are. We tend to be reactive on a wholesale basis. So. Um, as a result of that model, sometimes business continuity programs come out of the IT department uh, because a long time ago, that, that's all there was. Um, so when you get to a point where you've got business continuity planning going on, you have an organization that may or may not have a culture that is sort of ripe for business continuity planning, but has that mindset of always thinking as they implement you know, improvements to processes and as they do new business and so forth, are we thinking, how can we do this if we have a disruption, if we lose our people, if we lose our systems, if we lose um, our, our facilities and so forth? So when you talk to these folks, you have a challenge. They, they don't have business continuity plans and they know that they need them. That's a good place to be. But the better place to be, obviously, is you have business continuity plans and everybody knows about them and knows how to use them. But if we're in the, in the process of planning or some intermediate state, it's not bad if you don't have the plans, but everybody agrees that we need them because you're going to get some traction when you start the planning process. If you don't have business continuity plans and you don't think that you need them, that's a potentially movable position um, because you maybe have to educate your management and so forth to explain that the plans that you have in place, for example, to evacuate the building aren't going to really do you any good in getting your business back up and running. So. Some people might misinterpret some planning to be adequate for all uh, types of situations. The worst place to be is we don't have business continuity plans and we think we have them. And I've actually dealt with organizations in that case. That's worst case in terms of getting them to agree that they need plans because they, they don't see any gap. Um, so there's an issue there. So without business continuity planning, there's no thought giving given to the things that might be needed in those unlikely scenarios. And I say unlikely, sometimes they're completely unforeseeable, and, and we know that from experience. So we do all hazard planning, right? And, and uh, again, this is going to get us to a point of discussing the interaction um, with, with IT security. That's our focus today. For what do you plan? So a plan deals with the aftermath of a threat occurring, and it doesn't focus on prevention. So if we're talking about events related to IT hacking, IT intrusion, the criminal activity with, with our data and so forth, um, we turn to IT security and companies invest a lot in IT security. And the investment of those resources usually is pretty smart given what the world's like today. Um, so if you focus on a business uh, process and, and you've, you're looking at the loss of systems as only one element of it, which is really what you have to do. That's your business continuity mindset, right? You're looking at loss of facility, loss of people, loss of systems, systems, usually IT, and the loss of intangibles, your reputation, your disruption to supply chain and so forth. So that added level of preparedness increases your resiliency. Um, and, and I work for a utility and as an example, so utilities are, are a target, um, not just of, of, of hackers, because there's, I don't know if there's a lot of money to be made by turning the power off, but certainly by nation states or others who want to do your, your, uh, your, your, your society harm to cause societal disruption, turning off the power and, and even arguably making it stay off for a long time because of having done damage. Um, 
that's that makes it a rich target. So if they if that target isn't rich, um, it, it isn't attractive. And what I mean is, if they can get into the systems and they can disrupt things, they can get into a control system. They they can shut down the grid. They can misconfigure switches and 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 damage transformers that have a long lead time, for example. Um, that's very disruptive from a long-term perspective. You might cause a long-term outage. But if the system is hardened and it's got uh, redundancy, that's one way of, of create, creating a, 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 the resiliency that makes it a less attractive target. And the other way is if you hack in and, and it doesn't cause a problem because you have plans, business continuity plans, to function without those systems, then it becomes a less attractive target as well. Um, and, and the best example I can think of is an industrial control system that runs, um, you know, the, the electric grid, or if it runs the industrial processes that make products. Where if, you, you know, if you're producing, you know, machines, cars, whatever, um, and someone hacks into those, if you have manual processes that are easy to implement, which is not often the case, I, I understand that, but that makes it a less attractive target, right? So that's where we want to head, and that's where. From an IT security perspective, not all of the resources should go into IT security, but some of it should go into the aspects of business continuity preparedness that make it that less attractive target. So you commit to planning, and that, that way you don't need to plan. I suppose that's the way to look at it. But you're in the end, you're planning for something that's unlikely. And, and for people that are in IT, it's really easy to find out what's likely. Um, I was in IT for many, you know, decades and, and, and focused on that. You can read every day about who's doing what to whom. There's all kinds of intelligence. There's all kinds of dark web information, um, lots of help available. But pretty much anybody who's who's in that mode, you're there's always a cat and mouse game with the bad guy. And you're always trying to, to stay a step ahead or to um, somehow make your organization, I won't say impenetrable, but certainly hardened to as much of the bad activity out there that, that, that you can. Um, but what we're talking about here from a business continuity perspective goes to that next step, which is devaluing the target for someone who's trying to do harm to whatever it is. So if you've got a manual workaround, for example, and it can be performed quickly after an incident, it's less likely that that target would be attacked because they know it's not going to cause big problems. Um, so, so one thing about that, um, a lot of the automation that we see was put in ostensibly to reduce cost. And the way you reduce cost is you make them less manually intensive. And so if you make it less manually intensive, you free people up. Either you reduce the number of people that you need or you allow them to do something that you couldn't do before, right? And so when bad things happen and you need to rely on manual processes, those people may no longer be available. So just because 20 years ago you knew how to do it manually doesn't mean that now you can just go back to that because you don't have the skill sets and you don't have the numbers that you had before. So there's a, you know, it's a bit of a challenge, uh, certainly. Sometimes it involves cross training, for example. So IT security in itself has limited resources. You're always protecting against evolving threat. Um, and we have that challenge. Organizations with really good IT security still get hacked. And, and uh, you know, you could also say organizations with, with poor IT security seem to get by. And, and, it, and it may be because they're not attractive targets. It may be because they're lucky. It may be both. Um, but if you'll, I'll show you in the slide in a moment. Um, but uh, you'll see that getting hacked is, uh, I won't say it's nothing to be ashamed of, but it doesn't fall in that plane generally unless it's just plain carelessness. But uh, certainly most of the high profile hacks may have an element of carelessness, but it's usually something that was buried in what was otherwise a pretty rigorous program. So IT security alone is not adequate. We know that because all these companies that got hacked had in most cases good IT security, good practices, and they were just a, a, either an attractive target or just for whatever reason, it was their time. Um, it, that business continuity in those cases does become that real last line of defense. So the most effective resilient posture overall comes from good IT security, good business continuity, and good coordination between those components. And I'll tell you here anyway, and in the work I do, 
uh, across the, the utility community and in the uh, business continuity community, that coordination is um, it's escalating. It's um, it's well well received, and it's all the more common as time goes on. So two major types of systems that that get hacked, if I can qualify them this way, and I know it's a broad categorization. Categorization. I know I'm I'm probably whitewashing a bit of the complexity, but systems that store, manipulate, and use data. So websites, financial operations, and so forth. Those vulnerabilities. <coughs> excuse me are manifested in data theft and hacked websites and things of that nature. Um, and we see a lot of that. That makes the news often. And systems that monitor and control process, so industrial controls like factories, utilities, traffic control systems, transportation, um, those vulnerabilities are manifested in a loss of control of the system and the chaos that comes afterwards. So it could be communications being screwed up. It could be that, you know, like I said, you cause an outage. Um, such as has happened in other places in the world, and it's it's you know it, it's a known threat, and, and and people are working on it all the time because it's a bad day when that happens. Um, those are basically the two the two places where um, we, we have uh, great concern, and that's where we focus our efforts and our resources. So let's talk about some some uh, definitions for a moment. Um, a a data breach has a lot of definitions. So you, you you've exposed data outside of its intended audience. So it could be as simple as someone accidentally putting something in a, in a non-restricted area and allowing people to see it. Whether they see it or not, we don't know. If we do, obviously we know there's been a breach. The misappropriation of data where someone's actually expropriating, going in, taking data, pulling it out, and then, and then looking at the data itself. If it was exposed, does it matter? Um, what was done with it? What was the data? Was it confidential? Was it sensitive? Was it protective? Was it important? Was it personal? And, and different jurisdictions define this in legal terms differently. Um, and certainly um, from a corporate perspective, uh, it, you know, it, it has in many cases uh, great legal um, and regulatory uh, ramifications. And it also has reputational issues. Um, Organizations have to define data breach for their own purpose. They have to know what constitutes a data breach because they have to be prepared to deal with it. And again, sometimes it's not the breach so much as it's the reaction to it often that causes the company the greatest um, consternation and difficulty and, and in the end reputational uh, uh, um, destruction, if you will. So breaches can occur in a whole bunch of ways because as we've just said, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of breaches. So it could be unauthorized access from outside the network, could be hacking, unauthorized access from inside the network, you know, an inside job, someone with network access, someone with physical access or virtual access, there's a number of ways, but uh, someone who does not perhaps have access to some of it, or perhaps they have access and they're trusted but they, uh, but the trust is misplaced unwittingly, un, uh, and uh, so that that to some extent is the um, is the makes for the impossibility of protecting against all threats, right? Because sooner or later someone has to be trusted, even if it's a group, and uh, at that point, you know, there's the the human element. Um, a loss of physical media, media with uh, embedded data. So you, someone has a laptop stolen that's not encrypted properly. Um, Someone has access to their PC, their, their, their cell phone, their tablet. You know, as time has gone on and we've, we've increasingly extended our network, sometimes without a lot of thought, to people's cell phones and to people's home computers. And uh, it's, it, you know, we get into a car and our car syncs up with the, with the uh, cell phone or laptop that's in the car through Bluetooth. And the next thing we know, there's some information that's embedded in the, in the car so that the next person who rents it is able to extract it, perhaps. I mean, there's a lot of uh, media here. There's a lot of uh, a, a lot of places where the the data, formerly a long time ago, on a very restricted basis, uh, um, with access only from a physically restricted number of terminals, for example. Now we've got access points all over the place, almost almost infinite. Accidental or intentional release of otherwise secure data, so a programming error, a database access control miscue, um, something gets published that shouldn't, there's mischief, there's malicious intent, social engineering we see all the time. 
all of these things cause cause uh, cause us headaches if we're trying to prevent breaches. So how do we prevent bre breaches? So we implement best practice in IT security that reduces the likelihood. It also shows prudency to our stakeholders. So if you're regulated um, and something happens, you can always point to the good things that you did and why you did them. Um, when we do that, we do two things. We reduce the likelihood of a data breach and hopefully reduce the adverse effects from it. Um, IT security, great topic. It, it, it obviously, one presentation on its own wouldn't do it justice and certainly we're not gonna cover it in, in its entirety here. But the real answer is we can't prevent data breaches. So let's go back to the point we made earlier from a business continuity perspective, bad things are gonna happen, they're inevitable. And so if we look at data breaches as being inevitable, for example, then we can't. We know we can't mitigate all the risk. Maybe we can mitigate the consequences of the breach occurring. So there, there's where business continuity focus integrated with IT security comes in. So let's look at that. I mentioned before I would show you a little slide. This is an old slide. You cannot possibly keep this up to date. Everybody has companies all over the world that are being hacked as we speak. It happens all the time, regrettably. Um, there's big ones, there's ones that make the news, and there's small ones that don't make the news. But uh, I, I like to say that if you get hacked, you're in good company. I don't want to say, I said earlier, it's nothing to be ashamed of, certainly nothing to hang on your, your resume, you know, but, uh, but in actuality, um, these, these organizations employ good uh, security practices, in most cases, things that probably couldn't be foreseen, and, uh, and uh, they still got hacked. So when these things have happened to other organizations, the reason it's important is it really damages your reputation. And you can go back to that slide later if you wanted. I know they're recording this and it'll be available. But you can go online and find far more examples of organizations that otherwise had good reputations and they did something um, that, that soiled that reputation or, or a lack of action that soiled the reputation. Um, it, it's very costly. Um, there's a lot of significant direct costs, um, trying to make stakeholders whole, for example, providing uh, credit monitoring services to people that have been uh, affected and so forth. It, it creates a lot of liability. It puts the organization in violation of laws, regulations, and standards, and, and it can severely limit your ability to conduct business going forward. It depends on the nature of the breach and so forth, but it, it's, a, it's a horrible day when this happens. It has a lot of potential. Your reputation uh, is very, very difficult to recover. People will remember, uh, you know, a, a major organization getting hacked for a long, long time, especially, especially if they didn't respond effectively. We're going to talk to that. Um, so customers and stakeholders that are directly affected lose, con lose confidence. Um, they don't trust you any longer with their data. Um, your credibility with potential customers is, is similarly uh, affected. Regulators may increase their scrutiny. Um, you know, different places around the world have different uh, different regulations to follow. Um, the the uh, uh, there's a lot of focus on on upcoming uh, implementation of regula regulations in in the EU, but uh, but it's going on all over the world. And um, they, for an organization that shows a great deal of responsibility, and for um, you know having committed resources. To do, to do best practices and so forth. When you demonstrate that over a period of time, regulators get confidence in you, just like any other stakeholder. And they may provide regulatory relief in terms of you know, the type of scrutiny and the type of uh, um, uh, filings that you have to do with them. And similarly, if you get hacked, their scrutiny probably will go uh, up significantly and it becomes a, 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 a much greater regulatory burden uh, that you have to fulfill. Your network, your email, your servers, your website, they can all get blacklisted if they're seen as a source of spam or other IT security issues. So those are dark days for, for organizations, obviously. <clears throat> People, logically or not, are going to associate your breach with some degree of, inept, uh, of ineptness at conducting overall business. So even if your business isn't IT security and, and you get hacked, the other business that you do will be impacted in terms of people seeing that as, well, if they can't protect my data, if they can't protect their website, then how good are they at making cars 
or whatever else it is that that the company do, does. So the, there's a damage to reputation on a broader basis as well. So depending on the nature of the data misappropriation, there may be substantial remediation tasks. And, and I talk about this in terms of direct cost. If you've got credit card issues, you have to cancel and reissue new cards. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Making those swaps in your system, gaining new charge authorizations for customers, <coughs> notifying your customers and past customers and anyone else in your database of the breach. This is a massive undertaking. Um, you, you may have a certain number of, of customers, but you have, may have a lot of one-time customers, customers you did business with in the past that you may still have data on. And if they're involved, that notification may extend, extend to them as well. That's, that's a big undertaking. Um, credit monitoring services are expensive. Covering the losses that were incurred as a result of the breach. That's that liability we talked about. Notification expenses that you have to contact government entities. Um, you're gonna have legal expenses and you may need to bring in data breach specialists and other outside crisis management help. And one example I like to use is so, so a utility routinely prints uh, bills with inserts so that when you get your electric bill, it has some message in it and so forth. Um, and you may have, uh, let's say a million customers. And so over the course of a month, you may have the facilities whereby you send out a million uh, bills with inserts in them. Maybe if you ran second and third shift, you could send out two or three million of those over the course of a month. But if you have 48 hours by regulation to send out millions of letters, not just to your current three million stakeholders, but maybe uh, past customers as well, you may not have the actual physical capacity to do that. And so one of the things in your plan may be to contract with a third party to print and mail millions and millions of letters on your behalf in a very, very short period of time on your behalf. The cost of that is ex exceedingly high and preparing for it. You, you have to have the letters drawn up ahead of time and approved by legal and approved by regulators possibly. To get that all done in a short time means you have to pre-stage it and incur costs even when there's no breach. So those indirect costs can add up as well because there's future liability, because we don't know how in the future it'll affect customers and other people. We, we have, if you have data breach insurance, those rates may go up, um, or you may choose now, as is often the case, to buy insurance that you didn't have previously, and it's gonna cost more. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, that increased auditor and regulatory scrutiny may go on for a long time even into the future. There is regrettably a great lack of regulatory uniformity, um, even similarity. So you go from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. If you're in a, in a, 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 a country that does business with other countries, as is so often the case, um, in the international nature of everything we do online and so forth, now your liability extends to places where you may not have had any interaction at all with their regulators. At this point, if you want to continue doing business there, you may have to. Um, just finding which uh, jurisdiction has the most stringent and time sensitive reporting requirements doesn't necessarily mean you'll satisfy all the others. So, so there may not be a model you can follow that makes you whole everywhere. There may be something different that you have to do in different places. It gets complicated. Um, lawyers um, are, are good at that. They're good at making it complicated. And they're good at navigating the, the, the complication, the complexity. And, um, you know, you can have that discussion another day about the, the value that they provide, but it's real uh, in these cases. So very difficult to suppress information about something like this happens. There's usually reporting requirements, and the government often feels that it's necessary to share that news from a transparency perspective. I know of certain places where you have to notify their their attorney general, for example, um, their lead uh, legal person for the uh, for the jurisdiction, and they post it on a website. And the website looks like a who's who of of, of the, the corporate world, of the large organizations that are listed there. So it's something like this happens, you, you, you have to face the reality that it may have to go out right away. It's a disruptive process. Um, we talked already a bit about some of this, the undesirable media attention, um, the the, um, the embarrassing nature and ineptness that, that may be seen as a result of it, the blacklisting, credit issues. Um, 
your organization itself may be stressed over this. You, know, you, you have infighting and so forth. Different parts of your organization may blame other parts of the organization. And I know some people are probably smiling because this, this may be something that goes on on a routine basis, but a, a breach really stresses that and really causes it to come to a head. If it's, if it's the least bit below the surface, it'll come out. Um, it inhibits or stops e-commerce. Um, in some cases, that's all of a company's business. It triggers reviews of data integrity um, that can go back a long way. All of the processes that are involved there, again, the regulatory scrutiny, and it shifts focus from the organization's mission, whatever it is, to breach recovery. All of a sudden, everybody's doing something that really isn't productive, but has to be done. It's not something that you, that you set out to do, but it's something that you are now forced into. So the same initial approach for any business continuity risk um, is that you need a way to detect that a breach has occurred. And we know from experience that a lot of times a breach doesn't become evident till, till months or even years after they've occurred. Um, but when, they, when we do find it, we're often able to look back and see where it happened. And at that point, you know, it's easy to look back and say, we should have done this, should have done that. Um, you need a process for managing the response. That's your business continuity end of it. Um, and it has to exist within IT and for the broader organization. IT can't just hunker down and look at, okay, we have to protect from further breach, stop the exfiltration or whatever. We get that. If there's a gap, they have to plug it. That has to go on from a technical basis right away, and it can't stop. But at the same time, they have to manage the response because everybody's going to be asking IT, well, what's going on? What are we doing to prevent it? Uh, and, and where do we stand now? And what was, what was taken? Or what machines are compromised? Um, and, and IT may not have all the answers right away. It may take some time. So there's some crisis management just from IT's perspective, IT security included, um, as well as for the broader organization. There's internal and external communications that are crucial to managing reputation. And as soon as you put a chokehold on that by looking to IT for that information and causing them perhaps to have to stop doing more important protective work and to deal with that communication gap, um, you're really hampering not just your communications, but also your response uh, from a technical perspective. Um, the legal requirements might require notifications that, that have a time limit that you may be unable to meet if you haven't planned ahead. And you need plans what to do for your customers and your uh, stakeholders, and especially if you want to keep them as customers. So there's guidance from a business continuity perspective that IT and IT security can use. Now, how does the new risk challenge the existing business continuity plans as well as the IT disaster recovery plans? Um, that all hazards approach um, still focuses on people, facilities, systems, and intangibles, like your reputation. You have crisis management for a data breach, for, a, for a, a compromise of other nature. It requires a wide variety of the organization's resources, and IT and IT security can't, can't do that alone, but, they, but business continuity certainly can't do that without those folks. That's a, that's a, a, a joint coordinated effort, and you can't, you can't exchange business cards on the day of a crisis. You have to have worked together on this previously. The constituency of the, in, of the incident response team, or whatever you happen to call it, for a data breach is different than, say, if you had a fire or if you had a, uh, uh, a white powder incident or a, a pandemic, uh, people getting sick and so forth. Um, so that needs to be thought of ahead of time. And the timelines and roles have, <clears throat> excuse me, have to reflect the heavy involvement of IT, of legal, and of communications, possibly HR, depends on what type of a event has occurred and who's involved. It's not a good time to start getting these people together for the first time after a data breach or after a hack that has taken control of some systems. So detecting the breach has, has occurred. The first thing that you know is it's no guarantee that the detection will occur in a likely manner. As I mentioned before, some of these things didn't get, don't get uh, discovered. And in fact, most people who have industrial control systems are always looking to see if there's something in there that they don't know about. Uh, and the worst fear is that there's something there. And from a business continuity perspective, you have to write plans as if there's something there. Someone's going to turn it on someday, and, uh, and, and we have to be ready for that. 
So you have intake protocols, um, client calls to an IT support desk, web test tickets. How was the anomaly noticed? Something went wrong. I went to the website, to, to, to your website, to pay my bill, and I was able to see someone else's bill. Um, or uh, I went to the bank and um, I noticed some kind of a skimmer device in the ATM. Um, you know, we, we, we hear about these things all the time. They're, they're, they're growing more and more sophisticated, harder to, to uh, detect. Internal monitoring, routine activities that might detect log irregularities where you have an inside uh, threat, someone who's doing something that they shouldn't do, um, looking for unusual movement of data, intrusion detection. These are act activities that are routine from, a, from an IT security perspective. Um, and so maybe they're able to know what a breach looks like, um, but to, at what point do they bring in other parts of the organization because they suspect something? Um, that interaction with, with the greater business continuity perspective is important on an ongoing basis. The performance bandwidth and database management alarms. So you start to see things like, like your network's going in the tank because there's some large exfiltration taking place. Okay, It seems obvious, but, uh, but in fact, uh, sometimes they go unnoticed, right? Keeping up with security patches and notices and determining what was taken because that does matter. We went that way. Okay. Identifying what was taken, that personal information that can be associated with an individual in the States, U.S., it's uh, social security numbers, in other countries, other government assigned numbers, you have driver's licenses, state ID cards, financial accounts, um, uh, credit um, uh, and, and cash movement associated numbers, um, passport numbers, alien registration numbers. Health insurance information, because there's a lot of fraud in health insurance because there's the place where a lot of money moves around. And then critical infrastructure information, you know, the mapping of your network, uh, the location of devices that control switches and, and uh, machinery and so forth. Any proprietary and business sensitive information. So we know that if someone gets a hold of this stuff, we're in trouble. So knowing that, if we prepare and we say, okay, what if that happened? What do we do? And those are the business continuity end of things. Again, you know, there's some resources to be committed there, but that's an in, that's an involvement between business continuity and, and uh, IT and IT security that should be ongoing. Uh, it shouldn't be something that comes up after something suspected. Uh, breach communications are critical. To whom must you communicate? Something bad happened and you have a communications group or a department or at least someone who's preparing both internal and external communications ahead of time so that you're not writing on the fly because a lot of the stuff needs legal review and if you've got a short fuse you don't have a lot of time to to go through those kinds of approvals albeit you can put a team together to do that on the fly but it really helps to have some stuff uh, pre-written and ready to go how are you going to communicate Keep in mind that some of the communication may rely on systems that have been compromised, right? So that's something to think about. You also may have um, forensics and, and uh, uh, law enforcement involved, and they may restrict what can be communicated for some period of time. And you may have to change the way you communicate with your regulators who may say, you have to let us know within 24 hours or 48 hours and law enforcement who says, we're going to keep this quiet until we do this, this, and this, which may exceed that time. So now you've got a bit of a, um, a, a, a sort of a regulatory conundrum where you've got opposing interests uh, of different regulators. It does happen. I think probably people were chuckling because it happens on a daily basis to them. But when a crisis happens, it gets worse. So communications is two way. What are others saying about you? We all know about social media and so forth. but do you have someone who's managing your relationships with your government, with your uh, the, the uh, authorities who have jurisdiction over this, with uh, law enforcement and so forth? Um, if that's a close to the vest relationship that's kept between IT security and say um, local law enforcement or federal law enforcement, then there has to be some key that involves business continuity at some level so that in the event something happens, um, everybody's not strangers and the process is known to others. 
Again, what needs to be communicated, you're going to have to disclose the nature of the breach, whatever it is that happened. What did you lose control of or what information was taken? How much? What happened? When did it happen? When was it discovered? Why did it take so long to find out? People are going to ask that. Keep in mind that not everybody's technical. So the IT security explanation may have to be crafted in a way that's palatable to others. Um, where it happened and why it happened. What's been done to contain the breach? We also see statements about, don't worry, we've got everything under control. And then later on, we find out we underestimated the breach. There was more than we expected, or it continued even after we discovered it. So there's a whole bunch of uh, um, relationship, relationship and um, uh, reputational issues there that uh, you know go far beyond you know just the basics. Who's been notified, including regulators and authorities, and your point of contact, your point of contact for additional information. So someone from outside wants to get additional information, there should be a single point of contact. Now, that doesn't mean that with social media and, and the press and so forth, that people within your organization won't start talking about it when they shouldn't. Um, and that's something that requires you know, some, some degree of training uh, and um, qualification within your organization to make sure that that doesn't get out of control. The communication media. Okay, again, you know, we know email and other social you know, social media through press releases, mass notification systems, other call out systems, physical mail, uh, uh, interactive voice response for when people call, um, personal phone calls, um, could be for small numbers or for select people, government officials, for example. Um, you probably don't want to have them learn about it through the media. They probably want to have a, a, a direct phone call from someone in your senior management. Um, the mass media and social media considerations, uh, as always, and, and the social media one, you know, to some extent, it's really hard to control, but companies and organizations have learned ways to get out ahead of that. It's very challenging. Um, have to fulfill your legal uh, notification based on legal guidance. So again, don't forget to include legal in the, the IT security planning and the business continuity uh, planning. Um, they have to notify the people that have been affected by whatever happened, the breach or the loss of a, a control of the system. Um, law enforcement's probably involved. The attorneys, uh, attorneys general, there's some government uh, uh, solicitors, adjudicators, they're, they're different names in different ju jurisdictions. Um, other regulators, other third parties, your insurance carriers, um, GDPR, other requirements are going to be um, layered on top of all this, uh, and, and it's always changing. So these plans, like any business continuity plan, can't be static. They have to be dynamic. They have to be kept alive and, and kept up to date and reviewed you know, uh, you know, at, at minimal um, you know, time element uh, you know, intervals so that they don't get stale and are out, aren't out of date. What do you have to do for the stakeholders? Um, credit monitoring and so forth. Some of this is integrated with IT, maybe not IT security, but they're going to be managing it, so they, they're probably involved. Um, may need to make clients whole. Uh, we talked about that earlier. You may have to buy or use insurance. Insurance is interesting because uh, there is data breach insurance. There's insurance to protect your equipment and so forth. From, from pretty much anything, including um, someone taking control of it. Um, but the trigger for those insurance, we, you know, if you buy, I don't know, so let's just say $25 million worth of data breach insurance and you have a data breach, you, you don't just call up and say, send me a check. I mean, there's certain things that, that act as triggers. And in the interim, you have to start doing things based on those other time requirements that can't wait for that money. So, if you need the money to do it, you may have to put some other um, uh, sort of resources in place to, to get you through that, that gap period. And in fact, in some cases, there are breaches that, uh, that insurance may not recognize triggers for, in which case you may be left holding the bag. So you have to be careful on the insurance and be sure that you know, whoever's buying it on your behalf um, has reviewed it carefully, that it meets your needs. Um, at the end, after you've done all the things that everybody requires you to do and that you have to do for others, you have to think about what's the right thing to do. From a business perspective, this is kind of a question of whether you want to keep your customers or not, or whether you want to stay in business or not. 
or whether you want to go to jail or not. In some places, that that's that's one of the choices. So, so that that becomes uh, sometimes the ultimate and more difficult question. <coughs> Pardon me. So, just a re quick review. Um, you got to define the data breach for your organization. Uh, you have to be specific about the conditions. <coughs> you have to adjust the response for the level of breach. They're not all the same. Um, you have to be prepared so that you have a swift response, which is required. Um, you have to identify the causes. Any contingency plan, don't hardwire the decision. So <coughs> in your just contingency plan, you may define that you're going to do this, this, and this if the breach is for this many people. And if we lose this much data, we're going to do these things. Those are good guidelines. You can have all kinds of guidelines in there, but don't make it automatic because you may be doing things that don't make any sense. And you may recognize it. I've seen organizations do this where you're actually doing something and you're looking around saying, well, we should be, we shouldn't be doing this. This is too early to do this or this isn't enough. So predefine and in the, involve the people who are going to be re helping you optimize your response, make sure they're involved in the planning and practice. That's a key element of any plan. Document the incident, <clears throat> the people that are involved, the developments and actions taken. You need a scribe for any incident. In this case, you may need a, a, a lot of evidence. You may need to preserve a lot of forensics uh, from an IT security perspective. They typically know to do this, but from a business continuity perspective for the whole response, everybody should be making sure that things are tracked and saved because you're probably going to need to refer to it later. If for no other reason, for lessons learned to do it better if there's ever a next time. It all has to be coordinated with IT security. Everything has to be pre-staged and, and there's not enough time to do it on the fly. IT security is going to be awfully busy. Um, the, the, they're going to be doing forensics, recovery, stabilization, stopping exfiltration, and they're going to be managing to some extent uh, the content of communications. Coordination and preparation is critical. Organizations that bungle the response end up in dire straits. And, and from what I've seen, they all they, they lacked a, a good enough plan that they could use on a moment's notice and put into effect effectively. So what they had was maybe pieces of a plan or a plan that wasn't well thought out or they hadn't practiced it or they just didn't have a plan at all and they did it on the fly. And all of those things ended up with those companies really taking a huge hit. Control type systems that we talked about beyond just the breach. Um, you lose control. It seems like a straightforward response because you secure the system, you turn it off, and then you, you operate manually if you're able to do so. There's a lot more potential to be disruptive to society because it's so disruptive, including being physically disruptive. And then you have to ask yourself if an automated system can actually be managed manually, given you may not have the resources anymore because the organization is not like it was when everything was manual. So in the end, it depends extensively on that same coordination with IT security um, that got the organization through a data breach. Other business continuity and infrastructure connectivity, consider situational awareness on an ongoing basis. How do you folks talk to each other all the time? And how do you coordinate you know, your knowledge of the environment, the, your, your, your uh, known threats, threat assessment of new th uh, threats, um, looking at gap analysis uh, together, coordinating all that with your physical security. Depends on your organization, but in many cases, um, physical and, and IT security don't talk to each other, and they well should because they're very closely related when an attack occurs. And oftentimes, they're both types of attacks. That's one of the things that, that gets practiced often in, in, in the utility industry, at least, because uh, of the nature of the, the, uh, the system. And then leveraging high availability from an IT perspective and IT security and disaster recovery. It's a complex topic uh, separate from for another discussion perhaps, but when you have high availability systems, you have a system that if you have a, a server or a disk failure of some sort, it automatically fails over to something that's running somewhere else, even if it's in the next cabinet perhaps, but that may have the potential to be your disaster recovery solution at all as well. And if it is, then 
that high availability consideration has to be considered along with the IT security piece and business continuity piece so that they're all aligned in terms of recovery time objective, recovery point objective, and, and all that. So these are, these are you know, a, a very quick look at some other topics that relate to this, and I hope that's helpful as well. This was sort of drinking from the fire hose. I hope this was helpful. Ardian? Uh, yes, thank you, Edward, for this great presentation. I want to inform you that PCB provides training and certification services for ISO 27001 Introduction, Foundation Lead Implementer, and Lead Auditor. A PCB certificate will show your dedication in implementing and managing these processes and frameworks, and most importantly, you will be recognized worldwide. Now, we will go ahead and take some time to answer some of the questions from the attendees. Uh, we had a lot of questions, but because of the time limitations, I guess we'll only answer one to two questions. The first question is, how should BIA considered in BC? BIA is the, is the step that takes your risk um, uh, assessment, your risk management uh, threat uh, landscape type information, translates it against your list of business uh, crucial processes, those critical processes you have to do, establishes that inventory of processes, establishes what you need, all the dependencies, and and then comes out with recovery time objectives, recovery point objectives. That goes to IT so they can make a disaster recovery plan that meets those objectives. It goes to the BC folks so that they can help those subject matter experts on that process have a plan in place for when uh, for when the bad thing happens and you need to go into different resources. Thank you, Ed. Now, another question is, how important is crisis management communication during BCP restoration procedure? Pretty critical. It, it, um, it'll make or break you. And if you look back at some of the breaches, some of the other types of business continuity incidents that have happened over time, those... Um, where the communication was not particularly effective, that's where the corporation, or the organization, or the government, or whatever it was, um, was seen as inept, their reputation trashed. You can have an incident and handle it really well and come out pretty much whole, or you can have an incident and bungle it and, and you're a mess afterwards. Thank you, Ed. Now, because of the time limitation, we will only answer one more question, and the rest of the questions will be answered by email by Mr. Ed. Uh, sure. Some executives are reluctant to spend money on something that might not happen. Even worse, they say whatever we do, we would be breached. How can we deal with this kind of behavior? You, you know, um, you, you, can, you can show in some cases um, the, the need to do this from a regulatory perspective where you're required to do it as a, as a, uh, to show a plan, an effective plan as part of your ongoing business. So in the cases where that's not required, the next step would be, you know, what risk are you willing to take and what is the likelihood of it happening? And there's so many examples of this. You can probably establish a percentage as to the likelihood of a breach happening, for example. And, and breaches are, are awfully common now. That's, that's the reality. Um, what the statistics are, I'm not a statistics person, but I know that that could be calculated and I'll bet it's out there on the web somewhere. Um, I would say that's a good way to go. And after that, you know, it's like anything else. If you're willing to accept the risk, um, you know, you just move forward with that. Pretty much it's at someone else's pay grade. And if they're willing to do it, then I guess, I guess that's a somewhat acceptable response. The other thing you do is go somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Edward, once again for this very informative presentation. And thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar. I would like to let you know that this webinar will be recorded and posted on our website along with the slides of the presentation. For more information, please visit our website www.pcb.com. Thank you all and have a great day.